So hi everyone, welcome to uh, this second live webinar of the Collectors Conference at allaboutstamps.co.uk. I'm Matthew Hill, I'm the editor of the website and of Stamp Collector magazine. Um, today we have Ian Harvey, who's going to be speaking about stamp booklets for us. Um, just to let you know, we'll be answering questions, um, should you have any, at the end of the presentation. If you want to ask any questions, you can use the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your screen. Um, and you can also use chat as well if you want to chat um, to me or to any other attendees. Um, so, so that's it. So over to you now, Ian, um, if you can share your screen and begin the presentation. Thank you very much, Matt. And good afternoon to everyone. Or if you don't happen to be in Europe, uh, which would be absolutely excellent, I think, at this particular time. Uh, uh, then good morning or good evening, as the case may be. Uh, so let me just uh, start this little show here. Uh, so stamp booklets explained. Well, first of all, uh, uh, although you and I talk about booklets a lot, uh, this is not what the post office did. Uh, the post office uh, uh, produced books of stamps. And so what I have done here is to uh, put books here. These are, that's George V book, and this is a much more modern book, as you all know, that's Predecimal Machin. Uh, but booklets are technically those that come out of vending machines. <laughs> and uh, uh, this is uh, early, whoops, hold on, sorry. Uh, uh, this is a 1940 booklet, 38 booklet, in fact, and this is a much later down on the right. I seem to be having problems with my uh, little arrow <laughs> down on the right. This is a Wilding booklet much later. So there is a distinction technically between books and booklets. And uh, booklets, of course, only came in uh, with, the, uh, with Edward VIII, um, which was in 1936, late 36. And uh, uh, they went on really until it became impossible to get uh, a reasonable number of stamps in a booklet uh, out of a vending machine because of course you will appreciate that we have a maximum of a two pound coin and a two pound coin will now if you're extremely lucky probably next not next year but today uh, will buy you three second class stamps and somewhat less than three first class stamps. So uh, 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 stamp booklets, vending machine stamp booklets disappeared um, in about 2000. Uh, uh, on to where did we start? Well, the first book that is available to you and me is this telegraph book. And this is Benelli's Telegraph. Now you may, may well know uh, that there were a very large number of telegraph companies uh, in the Victorian period. This is the 1860s. And uh, uh, a lot of them, in fact, produced stamps, but a lot of them uh, didn't get off the ground as telegraph companies and they were uh, nationalized fairly quickly. So these stamps and these books were not used, but um, they're quite interesting in a way. They uh, illustrate that books existed. Um, this has a total value of uh, stamps in it of one guinea. Now, of course, uh, I should explain that, should I not, for uh, hopefully a number of listeners, in that a guinea is 21 shillings, and uh, 21 shillings for those aged under 50. Um, I hope there are some viewers, but who knows? Uh, 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 21 shillings is a pound and five pence. And that's simply because the seven pains of thruppence happen to add up to 21 shillings. Uh, uh, let us go on to the next stage. Now, the, the post office makes great moment of this book. This is a memoranda book, and uh, it was sold through slot machines. It is purely commercial. And uh, the post office had nothing to do with this except granting a, a concession for uh, the company, which was the Stamp Distribution Syndicate, followed by the Stamp Distribution Company, to sell 
memoranda books uh, uh, um, in through slot machines and they had in them a penny lilac in the back there. Now I'm cheating a bit, I'm sorry to say this, I'm cheating in that uh, that penny lilac happens to be used, but I hope you'll get the idea. Uh, also, uh, you can see, I think, that it is a perfect penny lilac. It had SDC here, the previous company was SDS. And this was the first attempt really to sell uh, postage stamps to the public. That is only, that's 1891. That went on for about two or three years, but they weren't successful and indeed they went bust. So let us get to the post office planning. Now the post office uh, uh, has a book here that was being planned. This is uh, early 1900s, very early 1900s. And uh, 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 they had to make up their minds whether they were going to have the binding on the right there or the binding on the left. Now you and I know that it is much more convenient to have binding of, for instance, a book on the left and then you open it from the right. Uh, 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 but they had to think that one through and this is uh, a dummy book with De La Rue dummy stamps in, uh, quite pretty. Uh, and then of course they got to planning the real thing so they had to decide on covers, that is the thickness for substance of cover, this says. Uh, they went on then, of course, to think about the color, uh, which we will see is red. And uh, this uh, uh, pane above it uh, uh, is, uh, uh, sorry, I went on there, didn't I? Let's go back a moment. And this pane uh, is a, a penny pane of stamps a dummy penny pain of stamps. <laughs> now to the first issues. Um, <laughs> these first issues had 24 penny stamps in, and you might have thought that that would be sold for two shillings, but you would be wrong because, of course, the post office uh, would never give anything away, would they? So they charged a halfpenny for this first book. But they started to realize <laughs> That, that's all a bit silly, isn't it? Because who wants to go round and pay an extra halfpenny? It's a bit like going into a shop and being asked to pay a pound and a penny, isn't it? So uh, uh, they quickly realized two things. First of all, that they needed halfpenny stamps for postcards. Uh, now that wasn't a miracle because by 1904, when this is being issued, uh, uh, you'll appreciate the postcards were in their heyday. So why they didn't think of that in the first place, who knows? But they also put in a pane with only five halfpennies in, didn't they? Because then they could reduce the price to two shillings. And that happened uh, through the uh, first Edwardian issues. So we get from 1904 to 1910. Uh, then we go into the Georgian issues. And uh, what we have is interleaves and advertising on the interleaves. And the post office, of course, uh, uh, created a role. Uh, they created an advertising agent uh, uh, and the advertising agent looked after all the advertising and solicited advertisers. First of all, they did it with uh, uh, these interleaves. And then uh, from about 1918, they decided that they could also uh, use up part of the front of the cover, which of course uh, is very high profile. Now, these, uh, uh, this advertising uh, in Georgian books and then through all the way up to, in fact, George VI, uh, uh, continued until 1943, but of course we got into the war. So advertising stopped in 1943, and then it came back in 1953, and we go all the way up to uh, about 1975. So this is a typical back cover in the 1950s. You can see that September 1957, and this is about uh, uh, 1973, four, where uh, uh, the uh, uh, post office agreed that advertising could come back onto front covers 
because initially uh, they felt that it shouldn't for one reason or another. Uh, so what to collect? Well, uh, I have, I suppose, two collections because I have books. I also have booklets as well, but here are books. And in those books, uh, you get uh, uh, obviously panes of stamps. So you can create two collections and uh, a lot of people do. Some people just collect books on their own because uh, they are numbered sequentially uh, at that time, in this time, they have dates on. So you know both the series and uh, uh, the times that they were issued. Uh, uh, but I like putting these things together uh, as I'm going to show you on uh, future slides. <laughs> Uh, but that, those are obviously typical as that book. A penny Hapney Payne uh, obviously was in this book there. Uh, again, just to reinforce it, this is a book of stamps, uh, uh, just to be uh, sort of te technically correct. How are these printed? Well, uh, I expect that most of you know that panes of book stamps or stamps from books uh, uh, have both upright watermarks and inverted watermarks. Now, obviously they didn't print stamps deliberately with inverted watermarks. It was all to do with how can you make up the book because you need a, a small binding margin on the edge of the pane. So here we have part of a sheet printed for books. And uh, uh, what I am trying to do here, uh, but I'm not getting my, uh, here we are. Uh, so uh, uh, I have a pane there of six upright stamps, and then a pane here of six inverted stamps. Obviously the watermark just continues up. But the point is that you need a little bit of a selvage there to bind into the book. And then if you're going to do sheets of these stamps, print sheets, you need a little bit of a selvage here. And this bit there uh, will be on the edge of that pane. And this bit here will be on the edge of that pane. So, the reason you get 50% upright watermark and 50% inverted watermark is that you have got these four panes, uh, 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 which are upright, inverted, upright, and inverted. Now, there's considerably more about this sheet to collect. Uh, uh, first of all, you may notice that on the edge of a sheet, you just have rules. So that's on the left side, obviously, and this is on the right. Uh, for the middle, they did the rule and bars. So if you think about this, you have got four distinct panes here because you've got upright with just a rule, you've got inverted with just a rule, and you've got both of these with rules and bars. So uh, before you even start, uh, you have got four panes. And then just to show uh, uh, that the, the, uh, um, uh, uh, all the components of the book were done in the same way, I put bits of some George VI books. I think you can see this is February 1942. And uh, uh, you can see that they're made up in precisely the same way as the sheets so that you can have uh, uh, 40 or 44 panes uh, in a sheet, and similarly, uh, the same number of covers and interleaves in order to make it up, uh, to collate it, just as you do normally uh, in an old fashioned office. Uh, now, the other thing I just want to draw to your attention is, of course, that that, uh, uh, that selvage is imperforate. There are no perforations across the selvage. Conversely, this is perforated through. So, and that is always going to be perforated through because 
the perforator uh, or the sheet under the perforator moved uh, from uh, left in a minute left here across to the right but if i also tell you that the sheet could have been presented to the perforator from this side over here then uh, on the right then uh, the right hand uh, pane would have been uh, imperforate to start it off and i would have had perforations there so again you have indications of uh, uh, where pains came from in the book makeup you also have extra pains to collect on to just to show you how stitching occurred uh, these are much more modern booklets as you can see these are 10p booklets i think in about 1974 uh, but perchance uh, we have uh, these examples which just show uh, how they did the stitching and uh, what happened was in a minute uh, uh, that you got your five um, five books booklets uh, um, across here and uh, they are obviously head to head toe to toe head to head and then toe to toe so uh, the first mass had double stitching just one set of double stitching that is with a single sewing machine uh, in that place uh, uh, that I have just indicated and what that allowed the the uh, um, stitching operator to do was to then flip the sides of these to just see whether everything was in order or whether for instance uh, um, panes or interleaves had got uh, messed up uh, and that, so having done that and being being happy about it what the operator did uh, was that he took he had a pencil and on the back cover just put his initials in a corner of the whole mass now this mass comprises that strip there about six times as high so they were 12 uh, books that way and five books that way and for instance he may have flipped this side and he may have put a little pencil mark on the back cover to just say yeah I've checked all this I think it's all right and then they did a second pass with the sewing machine so here is again the double headed sewing machine and then thirdly and finally we have this stitching on on the right so that just gives you an idea how all books were made up. The, the bigger books uh, uh, are four across. So you would do double stitching down the center first and then single stitching down the sides if you have the, the books rather than these little booklets. Let's talk about perforation. I referred to that uh, a little while ago with that part sheet, but uh, here I have three panes that are ostensibly the same <coughs> and uh, of course they aren't because uh, this pane uh, they all have rules but this pane just has one extension perforation that pane has no perforations and this pane is perforated through so that is why I was saying you can collect all these panes in uh, a number of formats <laughs> first of all by reference to the perforations and then also of course you will appreciate that these these panes come with rules and bars as well from the center of the sheet but of course the rules and bars one will will have uh, this perforation through if it has been perforated from the side of the sheet but if it's perforated up and down the sheet, then uh, they will all just have extension perforations. So there is a, a multitude of variety here. When we uh, move from uh, sheet printing of letterpress stamps, used to be called typograph, uh, but uh, we now refer to them as having been printed by letterpress. Uh, 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 
We moved in 1936, uh, for all stamps, as you all know, to uh, photogravure. And uh, these are obviously George VI photogravure stamps. And uh, the thing about these are that instead of being printed sheet by sheet, these are all printed in the reel. So uh, again, you're, although they were cut into sheets, uh, uh, they are going to be, uh, uh, or, well, they started by being cut into sheets and then eventually they were perforated in the reel. And the way that that worked in a minute, when I get back with my hovering here, I am in perforate again. There, I just have perforations on uh, one area. And you'll notice on this pane below that there are no perforations. So uh, uh, that is a bit unusual. And indeed, those perforations can appear just in the middle or just at the bottom. And uh, that was a temporary phase, only lasted about six months. So they're quite scarce because eventually you just go to this one little tiny perforation there in the corner, which again uh, can be in the top corner or the bottom corner. Uh, but uh, that was the no normal process as I will show you for uh, later ramifications of cylinders. The advertisements on the panes uh, are very popular uh, uh, from 1924 up to uh, 1940. Uh, they're all penny halfpenny panes, and that was to make up two shilling books because uh, otherwise uh, the number of stamps wouldn't equate to two shillings if they'd had six. <laughs> and uh, these, uh, as I'm sure a lot of you know, are very collectible, and uh, uh, so they're really quite attractive. Let me go to cylinders. Now, I said that photographia uh, uh, is done on cylinders in the reel, and a reel of paper accommodates in width uh, uh, two cylinders. The left-hand one is called no dot because the, the uh, uh, cylinder number in the side here, which I am still coming to, it's quite difficult, isn't it, to do all these things. Here we are, sorry about that. Uh, that says E6 and there's nothing there. This says E6 and you will just see a dot. So uh, through these, what I'm showing is a no dot and a no dot, that's 41, and a no dot as you go through the reins. <laughs> so H41, J5. Conversely, this is E6 dot, this is 41 dot, and that is J5 dot. So that's the right side of the cylinder. And then, of course, uh, you'll remember that just a moment ago, I talked about the, uh, uh, I talked about the uh, uh, perforation, and there is your tiny little perforation at the bottom of this J5 dot, as is a tiny little perforation, that 41 dot. And if perchance those dots had been cut out by uh, the stitching or the uh, perforation or something, that little perforation there would be indicative of the fact that you are in fact in a dot cylinder. And uh, um, that is one way to make sure that you know what you're looking at. Pains with books. Well, yes, this, this is certainly the way I collect and certainly the way uh, I like to see things. <laughs> These panes all match. They're all perforated through uh, and they match obviously with that book, do they not? Now, panes for booklets are um, rather unusual. This, these panes had to be printed on a particular, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, not from a cylinder, but from a particular plate. And uh, so uh, uh, they, they are, as it were, odd. 
and booklets were always difficult to produce. A lot of them were very much handmade. So uh, the, these were made into sheets. And then guess what? The sides of the sheets were actually torn off. And even the bottom was torn off. So I've deliberately chosen these panes to show you that there is an extraordinary amount of hand crafting in booklets. And when I go even further to the smaller panes of two, these are from sheets, counter sheets, where the first two columns have been torn down, torn off, and then uh, they're made into, they're collated up with these three panes, two of each, into that shilling book. Uh, pretty unattractive, but there you go. And you can see that those are off sheets because this shows the arrows from the sheet margin, which are on row, this is row 10. And then of course, row 11 has the next bit of the arrow. So again, one can see where a lot of these things come from, but you can also see how handcrafted these things have to be. Later, I'm now into well into the wilding period. Uh, uh, we have continuous real cylinders. Now, uh, what, uh, what happens here is that a cylinder has a circumference of 21 stamp heights. And so from 1935 to about the middle of the 1950s, uh, uh, what happened were that sheets were printed from cylinders with 20 rows of stamps and a blank row. And then uh, uh, the, those uh, sheets were cut off through the middle of the blank row. From about 1958, they decided that the blank row could conveniently become a stamp. So you have cylinders with 21 stamps all the way around them. And then what happens is that you have a cylinder number and because you're cutting off your stamps every 20 rows, the cylinder numbers on a 21 row cylinder will appear to move. They move down continuously as it were, because you're just cutting off 21 stamps at a time, 20 stamps at a time. And this again is no dot and dot, sorry, no dot and no dot. And this over here is dot and dot. So uh, now instead of having just uh, two cylinder panes of, uh, uh, for instance, matching, well, normally, oh dear, oh dear. Normally uh, you would have uh, uh, no dot at the bottom and dot at the bottom, and those uh, were your normal collection. But here we now have four from about uh, late 1950s onwards. Pictorial covers, uh, uh, very popular. These are pre-decimal Machin. Uh, and then of course, uh, that is a uh, decimal. And here we are back to a book. And of course, we still have prestige books, don't we? And we talk about these as books rather than uh, going back to, to booklets. Uh, 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 these pictorial covers continued from 1968 uh, up to 1973, four. Apart from the prestige, of course, which have continued forever and a day. And again, uh, then on uh, vending books, these are booklets, of course, we had uh, pictorial covers later from 1976 or 56 uh, up to uh, about 2000. Whereas you can see uh, for a two pound coin, you get 825p stamps, but now you would get hardly anything. And these are very popular as well. Uh, and of course, they have cylinders. So uh, here we have uh, 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 panes done by Harrison with their cylinders, panes done by Walsall with their cylinders, and panes done by Cuesta with their cylinders. Again, extremely popular, but uh, I must say an enormous number to collect because 
these cylinders wear out quite quickly. They're quite cheap to produce. And so, of course, you get an inordinate number of cylinder numbers. And again, uh, uh, these are 50p books. They, in fact, have stamps below here. But I've just cut off bits of my page to show you that you get extra perforations. These are really checker marks. So an extra perforation there, an extra perforation there, and an extra perforation there, because they are only one perf, one perf, but these are two perf. So really a lot to collect that varies over the various reigns. Now, I just wanted to try and be helpful and show you how do I mount my books. Well, although I put some black mounts around some of the panes to show them up better uh, for this show, I don't use black, uh, black uh, mounts at all, hardly ever, and particularly not for books, because uh, then what I do, this is obviously two stamps high, and uh, what I do is to use a hired, presumably you can use others, a hired mount, which is one stamp high, and it is one stamp high, and I do them head to head, and effectively I'm creating a little envelope into which I slide the back cover. So I slide that book across, and that's why I'm just showing you I slide it across. And that is just an example of what I do uh, for all my books. I, I find that putting corners on is, well, pretty well disastrous. You can certainly, you can never move them. Uh, uh, and if you ever want to take anything out, um, it, it's, it's a complete pain. So um, no pun intended. But uh, 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 this I find works fantastically well. And I do it throughout with uh, this type of book and then with the later books as well. Um, so you can, you can adjust as you see fit. I'm just going to run now uh, because I've only got a few more minutes. I'm just going to run through uh, other interesting things, I suppose. So errors, phosphor errors. Now, phosphor, as you know, uh, uh, was brought in again late, late, late 50s and then going into the 60s. And uh, the first color uh, was so-called green phosphor and, uh, and blue phosphor later. There were quite a few uh, misplacements. And uh, of course, you're supposed to have bands down the sides of the stamps, but they get moved into the stamps. So you get stamps with just one broad band instead of two, two narrower bands or two eight millimeter bands over the sides of the stamps. <laughs> There's quite a lot of this to collect. It's quite interesting. As you see, I can pretty well match up <laughs> an upright pane and an inverted pane uh, of watermark I'm talking about. Errors of printing, May 19 blank. Uh, uh, 53 has been left off. In fact, there is a May 195 as well. Uh, Luden for London, very well known this, uh, but quite nice. And then of course, uh, uh, we can get errors of printing and guillotining, can't we? Uh, uh, so uh, this is uh, rather spectacular. And then we've got these nice cover proofs. Uh, uh, these occur for both the pre-decimal machin and uh, uh, after uh, and the decimal machin. Uh, uh, using the pre-decimal machin, uh, here is the four and six book, and this is for the QE2. But you'll notice that this says Queen Elizabeth Roman II, which of course uh, is the queen. So uh, that had to be changed. And so you get interesting things of that nature. Here uh, is uh, Drake. Well, Drake was never used for a book, book cover. Uh, and then occasionally uh, uh, you get composites, uh, which of course everyone likes composites to have a number of items together. And Captain Cook was issued, but as I said, Drake was not. And then uh, the curlew 
that was used for 30 P booklets uh, uh, in the decimal period. Uh, and the eagle, uh, the golden eagle there was actually used in a six shilling book. So these things are quite pretty. And of course, you can match up things, anything that is, that is issued, uh, you can match up with an issued book, can't you? There is quite a lot of uh, uh, so-called advertisement proof material. These are galley proofs. <laughs> and again, you can match those up with the books that they come from. This says uh, ten, 10 shilling February, February 1968. This particular book is a paste up. That is to say, it is a previous advertiser voucher copy with no stamps in, and then uh, they've used it to put on these advertisements over whichever is the relevant interleaf to create a record, an initial record of, of what is being done. Pre-cancel panes. Well, <laughs> advertisers uh, uh, were sent a book to prove, to illustrate to them that they had their advertisement in it. But of course, uh, the post office doesn't give anything away, does it? So uh, you may get a book of stamps, but what you actually get in the early days, these would go uh, from uh, uh, the Downy Heads from uh, 1911 uh, through to about 1926-27, uh, uh, and the, the uh, uh, panes were cancelled uh, uh, at the uh, uh, at the London uh, Central Post Office, uh, and they were dated. So you have a councillor number there, uh, but this is a date, 27 July 21. Uh, so uh, that would have been in a three and six book when the rate was tuppence for postage. Uh, you may recall it went up from Penny Hapley to tuppence and then back to Penny Hapley again. And then I've used uh, similarly a Tupney pane here, George VI, because uh, after uh, uh, 1927, they decided that they were going to use a cancelled hand stamp. Now, this hand stamp is uh, a triplet. In other words, the hand stamp has those three cancels on it. They're all done at once. And you can see <clears throat> that this matches up very well. They are threes, uh, they are not sixes. And then to add insult to injury, uh, uh, the post office decided that perhaps that wasn't sufficient to invalidate the stamps, lest the advertiser should get uh, uh, some, something in addition. So they are punched. Now, this is most peculiar, and we, we really think this must have been the most odd job that you could do in your life, because these panes are folded down the center, and they are concertinaed. So those stamps have folds down the center and they're concertinaed together. And then this is an ordinary old fashioned railway ticket punch where you just punch once and guess what? You get precisely the same hole uh, in each. <clears throat> but talk about messing it up. Packaging, well, I will collect anything that enhances and anything maybe that I can show. <laughs> so uh, packaging, I'll start on the right because this is a full description of packaging. Here we have a book. Uh, this is a decimal book. Uh, it's issued in autumn uh, 1973. It will say on the back uh, autumn 1973. And then uh, what we have is a wrapper band. Uh, you can get lots and lots of wrapper bands. <laughs> and you'll see that it says there are 10 books there at 35p, and uh, they uh, add up to £3.50. Now, 10 books in wrappers then are put into uh, uh, packets, and so you have 200 books, so you have 20 wrapper, wrapper books into a, a, a packet, and that's the packet label. And then you do 20 packets for a parcel. So this is a complete sort of match 
of packaging, <laughs> uh, uh, which is reasonably easy to do for uh, more modern books. If you go back, it becomes very, very difficult. I mean, I have definitely not seen a parcel label uh, uh, going back, uh, well, certainly pre-war. Uh, uh, e even packet labels, uh, as, as this one is, because it says 200 books, similar to that 200 books. This is 1929, as you know. And so uh, uh, I, I match up the parcel, uh, uh, the sorry, the packet label uh, with the book. Uh, this is edition 104, that is edition 104. Uh, just quite nice to do these, these extra little things. Grill cards. Well, again, you can get more modern grill cards easier than you can old grill cards. Uh, this is during the wilding period. Uh, so it's 1957, 58. Uh, 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 this is much earlier. This is George V, 1921. And uh, as you can see, I talked earlier about a three and six book with the Tupney stamps on. This is a very large mock-up of the top half of the book that, that would have been issued. Similarly, at the same time, they were issuing three shilling books with 18 Tupney stamps in. Uh, so uh, uh, grill cards going back are somewhat more difficult. Just to finish, if you want to get uh, slightly more exotic, uh, here are specimen panes. <laughs> Um, uh, one gets these uh, much more for the earlier issues, the Edwardian and the Georgian. Uh, obviously, uh, I think that they are very nice, um, but this is really a matter uh, of what one can find and what one can afford. So uh, that just about takes me to the time that I thought was a good idea. I hope that you've enjoyed all this. And I'll pass you back to Matt, I think. <laughs> yes, brilliant. Um, uh, before um, we did the presentation, um, Ian, you said it was a very colourful display, and it, it certainly was. So um, thank you for that. There's uh, lots of nice uh, imagery and designs there, and it kind of stretches over quite a long period as well, doesn't it? So, um, oh, absolutely, yes. Yeah, something. Yes. something well, well I, I, don't, I don't go... Um, certainly much later than about 1990, well, no, 2000, I suppose. Uh, after that, um, it got beyond me. Okay, in, in, in terms of numbers being issued? Uh, well, uh, yes, uh, certainly the number, yes, the numbers of issues, um, if you go into detail, uh, uh, are, of course, extraordinary. Mm. And um, we all know that almost every opportunity is being taken to uh, produce another colourful book of one sort yes. or another. Yeah. I'm not talking only about prestige books, but uh, there were uh, other books which have first and second class stamps in, uh, uh, which also had commemoratives attached to them over a period of years. Uh, uh, and of course, even if you just take the first and second class stamps, mm -hmm. then of course you're getting the background, uh, which uh, has in it the security uh, um, uh, letters and numbers which tells you where they came from, where the, where the books actually came from uh, for being issued, whether the, and uh, whether they're 2018 or 2019 uh, from the background. So uh, it, it gets pretty complicated. Yeah, I bet. It's a, a challenge for someone out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. all the time well, there are a lot of people doing it yeah uh, it's just that i thought i would start at the beginning yes absolutely okay well we've had some questions in um just to address this one because it was just on the the final few slides there uh gordon hardy asked what are grill cards oh grill cards are if i go to the post office not now if I did go into the post office, and you'll remember uh, that the lady behind the counter was literally behind a little grill, and these cards were hung on the grill to advertise what books were there. Right. Uh, so, okay. 
So both those are cardboard. In other words, yes. those grill cards are cardboard. <laughs> there are also similarly posters, uh, which are um, paper and can be anything from A4 up to A1 in size. Right, okay. So it's which would be put up in, in post offices. To promote that particular. Yes. Booklet. Okay, perfect. Okay, so um, right at the start of the presentation, James Heal asked, was Britain the first country to issue books of stamps? Ah, I'm sure he knows the answer. Oh, okay. Uh, no, La La Luxembourg, in a, it, 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 it's a good question. It's a good question because Luxembourg, little Luxembourg, as they say, uh, issued books in 1895. Okay. And uh, our first book, of course, is only 1904. Mm. And we're not, we're not doing very well at all because... Uh, the US had books of stamps before us, Canada has books of stamps before us. So um, uh, by comparison with the Penny Black, where we sort of got off the ground pretty well, uh, with books of stamps, we're very slow off the blocks. And I mean, what is pretty extraordinary <laughs> is that uh, 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 these other countries were issuing books of stamps where, where they are bound on the left and you open them on the right, and uh, uh, that dummy I showed you right at the beginning mm. is seeing, well, shall, shall we bind it on the right and see what happens on the left, uh, which is completely bizarre considering everyone else had sorted it out. Yes. Yeah. OK. Uh, you could say that a lot about uh, a, a few things <laughs> about our country, maybe. Yes. Yes. Going our own way. But um, so uh, do, do you collect any of the other countries? Have you dabbled in any of those? <laughs> that would be a step too far, I think. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, as, uh, uh, well, as um, at least two of the listeners that you've now mentioned uh, know, um, I have, oh, probably the better part of two and a half thousand sheets of British stamps. And I don't put one pane on a page <laughs> so so that that is quite sufficient i think yes yeah okay fair enough um and then we have phil ward who asked um what was the proportion of stamps sold in books or booklets versus post office counters regular sheets i don't know exactly but the answer is very small uh, okay. um uh, I mean, when I say very small, uh, I would think no more than 5% uh, books to, well, sheets, to counter sheets. But presumably, uh, of course, a lot of sheets are going to be used commercially, aren't they? And uh, uh, then, of course, um, uh, as Phil will know, a lot of the sheets were made up into coils for commercial use as well. So books really are only for uh, you and me uh, as as uh, uh, just the customers, just normal mm. customers for our own use. Uh, and of course, they're supposed to be a convenience to put in your yes. waistcoat pocket, you'll remember. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, we've got some more questions coming in actually. So um, David Poynton asks, um, I've heard some pain, pains are punched with an office type of punching machines. Yeah. Are these official? Um, the pains I think that he is talking about are those uh, that I said had the London EC cancellation on. Mm -hmm. And uh, the answer to that is, yes, they are official. Um, uh, I think he is probably referring to uh, a period between 1913 and 1916, where uh, those panes that I was showing that that had the cancellations on them uh, uh, um, also had a standard five millimeter um, punch hole, uh, usually through the top left uh, stamp. And yes, it is official. Um, certainly all the books with that and all the panes from those books have come, I think, from the advertiser contractor sources. Okay. They, ha they have uh, generally not come, for instance, 
uh, uh, from commercial advertisers uh, where the apocryphal story was that a commercial advertiser would put a punch hole through the book he received and then he would be able to file it somewhere. Well, uh, maybe yes, maybe no, but uh, all the these uh, types of books and pains that we have have come through uh, the contractor source, not through uh, not through commercial advertisers, because you have to remember that a commercial advertiser received a maximum of two books. So for the number of books that are available on the market, uh, we would have virtually no books at all if they'd been coming from commercial advertisers. So mm -hmm. it is apocryphal that these punch holes were done by commercial advertisers. They were, they were done by uh, uh, probably post office staff. Yeah, okay. Okay, um, we've got lots of questions coming through actually, Ian. Uh, so Barry Stagg asks, was stitching on the books always black? And just related to that, Lloyd Nutter asks, how do you deal with rust from staples? So the first one was, was, was stitching on the books always black? Uh, the answer to that is no. Uh, sometimes they were uh, dark purple, I think. Now, this is totally from memory because uh, I haven't really um, bothered whether they were black or, or otherwise. But I think in the Edward the, uh, Edward the Eighth period, um, certainly there were purple, uh, but I can't quite remember the period. Of course, uh, the one thing he will know, even at, a, even at his young age, uh, is that uh, the Philippia book, uh, so we're 1970, aren't we? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think we're 1970, uh, was red. And if he really wants to get into it, he will find that there are stitching trials with six different colors for that book. Uh, but that's a one-off, obviously. Sure, okay. And Lloyd was saying rust. How do you deal with rust from the staples? Very difficult. Uh, the, the, uh, I have no solution to that. Uh, the answer is a, a very dry little maybe reasonably stiff painting brush and just try and get whatever you can off and don't start with it too rusty. But certainly, I, I mean, I let, let's not talk about pains, let's talk about books. Um, I definitely have cleaned rust off the staples on books uh, because after all, again, you can use your, your trusty little stiff, stiff brush without messing up the cover. And then uh, if you have a very small file and a very steady hand, you can just knock bits of rust off uh, and a lot of patience, by the way. Yeah. You, can, you can do a reasonable job cleaning things up, but don't for God's sake, um, you need to look at staples first because uh, they may just give way on you. It depends how, how badly rusted the staple is. If it's so rusted, well, maybe you shouldn't have bought the book in the first place, <laughs> yeah. but if it is so rusted, then you may want to not do a great deal. Okay, and and presumably uh, preventing rust, you know, if you've bought something and then you, you store well, it away. You, 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 no, no, no. Stamp collectors uh, never allow rust on there. No, no, no. 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 They keep it much more so. carefully than that. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, We've got some more coming through. So Philip Seymour asks, what is the time when the rarest books were launched? So um, which period, I think, is the, are the rarest books from? Well, uh, the, the answer to that is always when someone made a decision and then decided it wasn't a good idea. So to give you an example, <laughs> um, during the war, uh, uh, in um, April and June 1944, uh, 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 it was decided that a fi the five bob book didn't have a sufficiently bold cover. So they changed it to make a very unattractive cover with extraordinarily bold 
uh, five shilling and so on on it. And then they thought, whoops, hold on a moment, that doesn't look very attractive at all. So you've only got two editions of that. And uh, being the war, not many were kept. So uh, that book will retail or even go to auction in good condition at about a couple of thousand pounds. So really, the answer is, is always you're looking for uh, an unusual event giving rise to a short period. So I can't say, oh, 19, 1918 or 1922 or, or whatever. It, it's more a matter of recognizing uh, an eventuality. Yeah. OK. Um, and we've just got a, a comment just coming back to the, um, the stitching, the color of the stitching. Uh, Kevin Hart, Carhart said there was white stitching oh, on yes. the holiday resorts. But yes, issue absolutely 64. right. Yes, indeed. The first one. Yes, absolutely right. Sorry about that. Yes. Uh, uh, and then it, of course, went black as usual after that. No idea why white was used. No. No idea. Well, but there, there, someone there will know. <laughs> and so they should give you the answer. <laughs> yeah. OK, well, I think that's um, all the questions we've got. So that was brilliant. Thanks, everyone, for all those questions that came in towards the end. Um, just shows you how much there is to discuss on this subject, really. Um, so, Ian, thank you so much for your time. Um, while I've got you all here, I'll just do a little plug for the latest issue of the magazine. It came out today. Uh, this is our December issue. And you can see if I can get my fingers to point in the right direction. Uh, we've got a really uh, in-depth feature just about all the challenges of the year. We had an expert panel and we asked how collecting is kind of coping with all these challenges. Um, so it's really interesting read. So that's the December issue. And we do have a subscription offer just for the conference and it's three issues for 3P. So um, ridiculously cheap and a really good way to try the magazine. Did you pay, um, did you pay 3P? You can pay it online. Just oh, give it a go, oh, Ian. I'm sure. I'm sure I'll be able to help you through it. Um, so you pay three p, and then after those three issues, then you start a direct debit. Um, so that's nine ninety nine every quarter to get the magazine. So it's still much cheaper than getting it in the shops. And obviously, people are finding it hard to um, get out to the shops at the minute. So a subscription is. A I, I can option. I can commend it. I can commend it. Brilliant. I I, I collected your magazine. Uh, before you were there, as it were. <laughs> oh, right, OK. <laughs> Gosh, that is a while. Brilliant. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Ian. That's, that's good to know. So, Ian and everyone, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. Um, and there's another webinar at five o'clock if anyone would like to join that one. So thanks again and see you soon. Thank you very much. <laughs>